So today's focus is on like how to actually then build the, the second major component of a query optimizer uh, of how to actually do estimations on what we think the system is going to actually do when it executes a query. Like how much is it going to cost us to execute the query. So yeah, so this is not working. So the, the, the reason why we have to do this right, is to be sort of obvious. When we talked about the cost-based search models from the last two classes, I said that there's this sort of black magic box thing that, that's going to tell us that here's what the expected cost of executing this particular query is. And again, it's an internal cost. It's not something that's meaningful outside of the database system. I mean, you can't take my SQL's cost model, have it spit out a number, and then take Postgres's cost model, and take that number, and then make a comparison, right? This is completely uh, dependent on the implementation of the system. And it's really just meant for us to be able to say, this query plan is better than this other query plan for some reason, which we'll describe going forward in this lecture. And therefore, that's what I want to use, right? So the other thing important to understand, too, this is also independent. This cost model is independent of the search strategies we talked about last time, meaning whether we're doing top down or bottom up, right, it doesn't matter. Right? We, at the end of the day, we still need a cost model that still needs to make predictions about you know, you know, whether one plan is, is better than another. So if you're going to build a cost model, how would you actually do it? Well, there's a couple of different things you, you can include in it. So the first is our the physical cost. So these would be what is the hardware actually going to do when it executes the query, right? How many CPU cycles? How many cache misses? All right? Uh, how many? How much data you're going to read from disk, right? Um, this is obviously dependent on the the machine that you're running on and its hardware configuration. Because as 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 we saw in a couple of different examples, right? The, whether you're using a Xeon CPU over a Xeon Phi, right, those CPUs have very different characteristics, and therefore the performance of your algorithms or your query could vary depending on what hardware it is. So this is usually pretty tricky to do because, because of that reason, because it's hard to actually have build models based on all the different possible hardware configurations that, that could exist. The next approach is to do what I'll call logical costs. And these are where we're basing our cost estimates on the what the operators in a query plan are going to actually do at a logical level. So, you know, so a physical level would be, again, I, I read this many blocks from disk. A logical level would be, I'm going to read this many tuples from a table. Or my join operator is going to spit out this many tuples uh, after the join. Or my scan is going to filter so many, so many tuples. So for these, this is going to be independent of what algorithm we're actually using in our query plan. So this is only looking at the logical operators, not the physical operators. Right? And this should, this should be sort of obvious, right? If I'm doing a nested loop join versus a hash join, at the end of the day, both algorithms should, should generate this, the exact same uh, result, right? the same number of tuples, because right? otherwise I have problems in my implementation. Uh, and so therefore, we don't care whether, in the, in, in, for logical estimates, we don't care about whether it's, you know, it's one algorithm versus the other. So the tricky thing is going to be, and what was in the paper that you guys read about and we'll talk about going forward, is you're obviously going to need to be able to estimate accurately what the output of an operator is going to be because that's going to be fed in as the input for the next operator. So in order to say, right, you know, the number of tuples I'm going to read into this operator and therefore generate this much output, I need to know what came below me in, in the query plan. And that, again, that, that's going to be the hardest thing we have to do. And the last one is going to be uh, sort of algorithmic cost or asymptotic com complexity of the, the, of the operators. Right? And this is where it actually matters whether we're doing a hash join or a nested loop join or index scan versus a sequential scan. Right? And again, for these ones, we, you know, we, we, can, just, we can just sort of have uh, weights to be able to say, oh, the, the hash join is, is you know, x times better than, than a nested loop join, and therefore prefer that. Right? But there are obviously some scenarios where the nested loop join would be better. So as we'll see as going, going along, and actually I'll, I'll show the next couple of slides, uh, what we're primarily going to do for an in-memory database is going to be a combination of these two. Um, for this one up here, it, it, you can do it, but it's hard. Um, and this is another good example of like, the difference between the 
commercial database systems and the open source database systems. So at the talk, the Redshift talk on uh, on Monday, if you went to that, uh, Ippocratus mentioned that like, oh, like the the query optimizer in their system is is notoriously difficult, and you know the they've spent a lot of money fixing it up at Amazon, and it's way better than any of the open source ones that are out there. Like commercial, it's sort of commercial grade or enterprise grade, because the enterprise guys are going to include all of these things. Open source guys probably just include to, to these two guys. So for a disk-based database system, the most obvious thing that we care about is the disk, right? So the end of the day, that that's the most expensive thing, right? Feeding, getting things off of a of a you know spinning disk hard drive, um, or, or or an SSD. So in this world, the CPU costs are, are they're not negligible in the sense of like we we can ignore them, but if your cost model only includes how many blocks of data that, or you know, how many blocks of data did I read and write from disk? That's probably going to get you, you know, ninety percent of the way there, right? Who cares what you actually do when you bring the data into, into your uh, into memory? Like, is just getting from disk is the most expensive thing. And obviously, on a, uh, it's 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 less of an issue on modern SSDs, but definitely if you have a spinning disk hard drive, you know, taking into account the difference between sequential I/O versus random I/O is is a big difference. And a lot of times, again, you see in a, in a disk-oriented database system, especially older ones, they use algorithms that are, that are designed to optimize the amount of sequential I/O you're doing. Right. So the important thing that though you know the understand about in a disk-based system is that the database system is going to have complete control over what's in memory, over its buffer pool management. Assuming you're not using MMAP, which well we can discuss later. Uh, the, you know, we know exactly in our databases, we know how we're actually bringing uh, blocks in. We know how we're writing blocks out. We know what, you know, uh, what algorithm we're using to decide what data is cold, what data we want to evict, right? So we have complete control over this, and we can include this in our calculations in our cost model. We know how, you know, if we're going to give this amount, of mem this, this amount of memory in our buffer pool to run this query, and therefore it has to read this amount of data, uh, whether that's sequential versus random I/O, we can then you know, take that into account into our cost models to make estimations of what we think the query is actually going to do. All right. So, I would say you know th this is this is what I'm describing here is how you would do this on a single node disk-based database system. If you're a distributed database, just replace the word disk with network. Right. That's, that's basically the same thing, um, and you have the same issues. So I, I want a quick example of what Postgres does. Um, the reason why I, I always like to use Postgres as an example uh, for describing how you know it, it, how a real system actually implements this is that, in my opinion, it's, it's like almost like a textbook definition or, or, or implementation of a database database system. Like if you take any introduction class, you take the textbook we use in that, and the way they describe the algorithms in, in the textbook is almost exactly how it's actually implemented in uh, in Postgres. So for Postgres, they're going to use a combination of CPU and I/O costs. Um, they're going to be weighted by these what are called magic constant factors, right? Magic magic weights, um, and the reason why you do this is basically you just say like because it's dependent on what the hardware actually can do. So they'll say you know sequential I/O will be uh, you know x times faster, x times better than uh, than random I/O, and memory I/O will be x times faster than sequential I/O, right? So in this environment, they are obviously targeting, a, 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 in the sort of default configuration, a, a database that's on disk, and therefore you don't have a lot of memory. So that, again, they, they want to use that in their cost model to account for um, uh, you know, what's actually going on. But the tricky thing is, they expose this to you as, as, as an administrator, that you can actually tune these weights for you. Right? So the default is the memory is 400x faster than reading from disk, and then sequential I.O. is 4x faster than random I.O. So you can go in the uh, look in, in the documentation to see how you change these these costs, but then they have this nice little warning here that basically says like, if you start mucking around with these, uh, you could have problems, right? Because again, these these are highly dependent on what the actual workload is and what the data looks like and what your hardware actually looks like. It's really hard to get this right, All right? So most people don't you know don't don't tune these things because they don't know they don't know what you're doing. And you don't want to cause uh, regressions on you know some portion of your workload. To give you an idea of what a commercial system does, we can look at what DB2 uh, does in their system. Of all the three major systems, DB2, SQL Server, and Oracle, D2 
DB2 is actually the most open about discussing what their query optimizer does and what their cost model actually does, right? Uh, I, there's no, as far as I know, there's no major publications um, from Oracle or, or SQL Server that talks about what, what they do, right? We just sort of know some things based on talking talk to people there. But IBM is actually pretty good about discussing this. And this all comes from a presentation from Guy Lohman, who was the guy that invented the Starburst stuff that we talked about uh, two classes ago. So the DB2 cost model is a combination of all of these things. So the, first of all, they're going to look at what the database actually looks like, so the schema, any statistics they collect on the tables, the columns, or any indexes. But then they're also, when you, when you turn the system on, they're going to run these little micro, benchmark, micro benchmarks that are going to stress test like the CPU, the disk, uh, memory, and the network if, you, if it's a distributed system. I, and they're going to use that to, to essentially generate the weights that I was showing you in the last, last slide for, for Postgres. So Postgres, you have to set these weights manually. DB2 tries to figure this out for you and tries to be real fine-grained based on what your hardware can actually do. But then also when you actually start doing cost estimation for the query that shows up, they just don't look at your query in, in isolation by itself. They also account for what, what other things are running at the same time and then use that to determine you know, what the effect of, of those concurrent operations are on for your particular query. Like if you're running by yourself, then you know you take all the memory in the world and you, you run really fast. But if you, the bunch of other queries are running at the same time, you're not going to get all the memory. So therefore, they, they, take, they take that into consideration when they estimate the cost of your query plan. Right, so again, this is just it's way more sophisticated than what any of the open source guys do. And the Postgres one, as far as I know, at least the last time I looked, is... is is much better than the MySQL one. Um, it's probably the best open source, it probably is the best open source query optimizing cost model that's out there today. Um, at, least, at least a year ago when I looked, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, can't think of anybody else that got better. All right, but we care about in-memory databases. So what do they do? So from looking at the documentation and manuals of the, of the major in-memory database systems, um, as far as I can tell, everyone does does what I'm describing here. So basically, the disk is gone, so you don't care about disk I.O. Yes, you have the right to the log, but that's incidental. Right? That doesn't affect whether you choose one particular query plan versus another. Like if I update a table, like who cares? Like uh, the disk is not considered in the cost of that, of, of writing up the log record. Right? So at the end of the day, the pr they're, all the in-memory databases are going to do a combination of of primarily how many tuples are being processed by an operator and how many tuples they're generating, and some basic weights to, do, to say hash joins are better than, than nested loop joins. But the, the number of tuples in and out is, is, is the major factor. Um, the reason why you can't actually do anything more fine grain or, like, and like, or account for how much memory I, I'm going to be able to use for my query in the same way you could with um, in a disk-based system is because we have no control over actually the, the cache management of, of our systems. Right? That's all done by the CPU, and the CPU, we can provide hints to it, we can prefetch things, we can try to pin things in our caches, but at the end of the day, the, the CPU decides on its own what gets, what gets moved in and out of the cache. So we don't even bother with any of that. So we just try to, 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 to estimate how much data my, is my operator going to read and write. And it turns out that ends up being a... Or I'll say a reasonable estimation of what you know the the CPU resources I'm gonna I'm gonna use to run my query. So now this also say also this is not also accounting whether um, like whether I want to run a one thread versus a hundred threads, right? That's sort of a separate policy that's different than uh, what we're trying to do here. Right? That's sort of almost like a mission control or, or resource management for the system. So typically, as far as I know, you don't you don't see that in, in accounted for in the cost model. And that sort of happens after, after, after the fact. And again, if, if you have it, like, even if you're, if you're an in-memory system, like a, like a MemSQL, uh, since they're distributed, again, go back to the last slide, they care about the network. So they, they have to account for that. And, and not so much, um, I mean, this still matters, but like, the network is, is, is the major factor. All right, so I want to give an example of, a, um, of, of what was a sophisticated cost model uh, from the 1990s, uh, done in small base, that actually does some of the things that we talked about with DB2. Um, so what they would have is they would have this sort of two-phase approach where the, 
as the database developers were building the systems, like at, at, at the company that were building Smallbase, they would try to identify what are all these low-level primitives of, of during the, that, that, that occur during query execution. Whether or not they're primitives, like in the same way, they're not really like in, in vectorized primitives where you had like those for those, but think of like low-level things like I read an index or I or write to a tuple. Um, so they generate these low-level operations uh, and then they create these micro benchmarks that allow them to sort of simulate each of these different operations. So then now at runtime in, in your system, when you deploy, uh, deploy small base, they would take all these micro benchmarks, run them when you turn the system on, collect some profile information about how fast your, your machine is, and then in the cost model, when, the, when you look at a query plan, you count up the number of these low-level operations or primitives that they're doing, multiply that by them by the, the, the micro-benchmark results that you collected, and then that's how they're determining what, you know, what the cost of executed query plan is. Right? So for again, Smallbase was this uh, early MMR database system prototype out of HP Labs. HP Labs then spun it off as a separate company called Times 10. And then Timestand got bought by Oracle in like 2006. And it's, it still exists today. Uh, you can download it. Um, the old system used to beat it. We haven't tried it against our, our new system yet. Um, the Oracle primarily sells it as like a, like a CPU cache, or sorry, an in-memory cache for the, the main Oracle like flagship database. But you can still run this as, as a standalone system. But as far as I know, again, by looking at the documentation, what they did in the 19, like this paper from the 1990s, they don't do in the real system today. They still do, they do what I've described before. They just estimate what the number of tuples in and out for an operator is. Um, this is similar, this approach is similar to BOGO MIPS, if you know what that is in Linux. Right? When you boot up Linux, uh, they run this thing, this little micro venture called BOGO MIPS that tries to approximate how fast your CPU is. And they use that for timings, uh, deci decisions for like interrupts and scheduling. If you ever look at like slash proc slash CPU info, you'll see like you know here's the here's you know here's my Intel CPU, here's the the, the model number, here's the cores I have. There'll be a, there'll be a little entry called BOGO MIPS, and you use that as an approximation of how fast your CPU is. Okay, so I said that the most important thing we're going to care about is the number of tuples in and number of tuples out or processed by uh, by by an operator. So now we've got to figure out how we're going to actually going to be able to estimate that. So the way we're going to do this is that we're going to try to estimate the selectivity of an operator, uh, which is going to determine the percentage of the tuples that are fed into it. Uh, it's the percentage of the tuples that will then be emitted as output. Right? So if, I, if I'm given 100 tuples and my selectivity is 10%, then I'm going to emit 10 tuples. Right? So the way you tr traditionally do this in a database system is you can just model this as a pr the probability of whether a predicate will be satisfied for a particular tuple, right? And so the way we can generate now these, these probability estimations is through a combination of, of these different techniques. So we have domain constraints, right? This would be something like if we know the, if we know the value range ahead of time of a particular uh, attribute, like if it's an enum field, we know that there's only the cardinality is fixed. We can rely on pre-computed statistics that we can generate and put into our, our data blocks and our tables. I mean, we talked about this before when we talked about compression. These are like zone maps. So I can pre-compute aggregations for different columns in my in a block. And then when I want to figure out whether a uh, what's the likelihood that my operator is going to match or my predicate is going to match a tuple within a, you know, within a block, I can look at the zone maps and maybe derive some early information, like, like a min and max value. Uh, we can also use histograms or approximations, which I'll talk about in a second. And then we can also do, do sampling. So there's no one of these is better than another. Like, like you kind of want to use a combination of all of these things if you can to try to estimate selectivity. Like the more information you can get, the, the better. So. The, now the number of tuples that, that, that we're going to be end up processing is going to be a combination of is the, is the, the number of tuples that we're going to process it would be dependent on, dependent on three different things. So first is obviously the access method that, that we're using to, access, to, to read tuples from the table. Right? If it's a sequential scan, then we're, we're going to potentially look at everything unless we push down a limit clause. 
Uh, if it's an index scan, then we can be more fine grain and only look at you know uh, the subset of the total key space. Then we have actually the distribution of the values of the database attributes, right? And this is where the estimation stuff is going to come come into play to, to be able to know, you know, for a given predicate, what's the likelihood or probability that I have values and in, in in you know that would satisfy that. I mean, of course, then also what 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 are the actual predicates themselves, right? If I'm doing a a quality predicate on a unique column, then I know my selectivity is going to be one over the number of tu tuples that I have because only one attribute can match. But now if I just start doing a range scan, then this becomes more problematic to try to estimate this, right? So the main takeaway is that for simple queries, like something equals something, uh, we can do a reasonably good job for, for matching that. If you start throwing in uh, inequalities, throw in uh, range scans, throw in uh, disjunctions, then it becomes really hard. And again, again the more data you can get, the, the better. So. One approach, again, in, in the intro class, we teach you how to generate histograms, right? That's basically you run the analyze function or analyze operation in your database system, and that does a sequential scan of your table, and it, it computes some kind of uh, uh, you know, histogram based on what, the, what values it actually sees. So that's the, again, that's the standard technique. What's been uh, sort of more prevalent in recent years is to generate, instead of exact histograms, to generate what are called sketches, which are these approximate data, data structures that can give you a hint about what the, you know, is contained in the data. So think of this as like a, like a, like a the bloom filter is an approximate data structure, right? because it can give you false positives, but it'll never give you false negatives. And you can't actually, it won't tell you what values or, or keys are actually in the bloom filter. It is, if you just ask it whether something exists, it'll give you a true or false. So these sketches are a little bit more complicated. Rather than giving you, you know, simple true and falses, they can actually tell you values that could, that could exist, right? But again, you could have false positives. I don't know what some of these. I don't I, actually some of these. I don't know whether you get false negatives as well, right? So there's a bunch of different kind of sketches that that people can use, right? Uh, the reason why I bring this up was a few years ago we had the uh, the CEO of Splice Machine. Uh, come and give a talk in, in the intro class. And uh, he's CME alum. Um, he's on the, the, the board of advisors for the dean. And he, he was here in, in February. And he made this comment about when he was talking about their query optimizer and their cost model was they did the textbook way initially where they just build histograms first. And they used the standard algorithms, equations to try to do estimations on, on the selectivity of, of predicates in their operators. But then they end up using this sketching library from Yahoo that did these approximations, right? So you can bound the, you get error bounded estimates to be able to say like, oh, this is what I think it's gonna be and here's, here's my confidence about, about what, what I'm telling you. And they said that when they switched to using these sketches instead of histograms, the accuracy of their predictions and the robustness of their query optimizer, right, primarily because of, because of their, their better, the better cost model, the, the difference was quite significant. So I think they said they like in the old system when they were using histograms they could do the cost model would be okay up to like ten tables per per query like a ten table join, but when they added this then they, I think they could go up to like seventy five tables, which is again it's not it's not I'm saying that's the right metric to use to determine the, the quality of your cost model but that that was sort of anecdotal evidence to, to, to that suggested that using catches was was better than histograms, and in our old optimizer in the old system. We ended up using histograms as well, but or sorry, we ended up using some of these sketches as well. Uh, but we never, we never vetted it. We never knew. We never actually measured how much better it actually was. And again, so I, I this approach I think is also used in, in commercial systems. The other main technique to generate estimations about the selectivity are to do sampling. The basic idea here is that rather than look at these sketches or the histograms and try to approximate what the selectivity is, let me actually just take a, a subset of the tables I'm accessing, run my query on that, or run my scan with predicates on that, and then determine what my selectivity is, and then assume that my sample is a good approximation of what the, the total table actually looks like, and then now I have better knowledge about making my, 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 my choices in my cost model. Right? So, there's basically two approaches to do this. There's like online versus offline. So the offline approach is 
you, you, in the background, every so often, you, you generate this, this read-only copy of the, of the table uh, that you sort of put aside, um, and then you do, all, and that's your sample, and you use that in your cost model to, to predict the selectivity of your predicates, right? And then you have this sort of, this, this background job that looks and say, says, well, ha, what, how much of my data has changed? And then if it's, you know, if it's above some threshold, then I go back and refresh my, my, my sample. The other approach is to do this in an online fashion is when the query shows up and you go in your cost model, you actually go on the real table and run your, a little bit of your, of your query now and, and then determine what the, the selectivity of your predicates, predicates are. And obviously this becomes tricky because you have to, you know, you're trying to do a cost estimation for, for running your query, uh, but now you actually get to run, run something of the query, some subset of the query on the table and that could end up being slow. Um, and then you also don't want to slow down other transactions or queries that are running at the same time. So you want to run, make sure you run this on read, read uncommitted without, you know, without updating any latches or locks to avoid interfering with anybody else. So the way to think about doing the sampling thing is like I have my where clause. Rather than doing any, any joins, I just pick out the predicates from, from my where clauses and my join clauses, and I just run that on the on the you know on the tables themselves to compute this. Of course now this becomes hard if you have joins because now the selectivity of the join is tough to compute unless you start joining things. Um, so to the, ex the extent in which people use uh, different systems use sampling aggressively uh, will vary. Um, and this is where again this is where we get into like commercial systems are doing something that, that they don't really talk about publicly so it's hard to know what they're actually doing. All right? But I know in the case for the paper you guys read I think they even mentioned this in the paper. SQL Server performs the best. SQL Server, Server is doing a combination of, of histograms or approximations plus sampling. Okay, so any questions about this? So that we're using this to figure out, we have to use either histograms, sketches, or sampling to figure out the selectivity of, of, of these predicates. And then we can use that to compute the cardinality of our operators, which is then the, 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 the amount of data that's, that's being generated right, as, as the output. Right, and the reason why we want to know what this is because that is then being fed as the input to our um, to our to our next our, our you know our next operator, and the problem is going to be that the more inaccurate our estimates are for the cardinality, the selectivity of our predicates in, in these operators at the lower parts in the tree, then that's going to ampl get amplified as you go up because if I'm, if I'm off at the the bottom leaf node, as I go up, that error gets carried over, and now I become even more off. Again, and again, this is what you saw in the paper you guys read. All right, so the textbook way you would actually compute the cardinality uh, is by modeling the, the the selectivity, as I said, as a probability, and then you make the following three assumptions about that those probabilities. To be able to compute what the, what you know what the the, the cardinality is going to be, the selectivity is going to be, right? And again, so I would say this is what I'm describing here is what we teach you in the interruption class. If you go read every single textbook about databases, this is what they would tell you. And hopefully, they would say the caveat like, oh, this goes this goes real wrong real quick. Uh, but people still do this, right? Because there's no there's nothing else, right? The only other way to, to the only way to get the exact cost of a query is actually to run the query. But that's actually super slow, so you can't do that. So you make these assumptions, you make these these sort of trade-offs in the accuracy, just to be able to get something uh, that works reasonably well. So the first assumption we're going to make in many cases is that we're going to have a uniform distribution of values for, for for in our attributes, meaning the probability that a given attribute appears in my in my in my column is the same for all values. Of course, we know that this is not true. Right, more people live in New York City than than in Montana. So I can't assume that that you know that the zip codes in Montana have the you know, the same probability of occurring for people a people database than in people in New York City. All right, the way you typically get around this is is to maintain a separate data structure for what are called heavy hitters. This think of this as just like a, a a little hash table on the side that says you know here's the top ten or top twenty uh, uh, values that occur in in my column. Right, because because more times than you know I'm more likely to query those values. And therefore, I can go do a lookup in, in this heavy hitter table and get more accurate estimates. But then everything else is just assumed to be uniform. The next is that we're going to assume that all our, uh, our, our predicates are independent. So 
again, we're modeling these as probabilities, so that means we can actually multiply them together, and that's going to produce the true selectivity of our, of our predicates. Of course, that's not going to work. We'll see that in the next slide. Um, and the last one is that the we're going to assume that the join keys for inner relations that we're trying to join on will always exist in the outer relation. Right? This obviously doesn't work, and then if you start doing left outer joins or right outer joins, this becomes problematic. But again, this is this is another major assumption that that people people have uh, in their cost model. So let me show an example how this all goes bad. Um, in this great little vignette of this this sort of uh, this simple problem that again that was that was in a blog article from from Guy Lowen. But I like this because it illustrates exactly all the problems would have that you have when you make all those assumptions. So say you have a simple database keeping track of cars. And you have, you have in your database, you have 10 different models, like Tesla, Honda, Ford, and so forth. And then, sorry, 10 makes, Tesla, Fo Tesla Ford, uh, Honda, Toyota. And then you have 100 different models. So like a, 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 a Ford um, Escort is, 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 is a model, or a Toyota Corolla is a model. So you have 100 of those. So if you have a query now that says, where make equals Honda and model equals Accord, right? so we have a conjunction and two equality predicates, if you make the independence and uniformity assumptions from the last slide when trying to estimate the selectivity of this predicate, right? then you're going to end up with 1 over 10 because we have 10 makes. right? So we, and we, it's, it's an equality predicate, so it's Honda can occur once, so it's 1 out of 10. And we multiply that by 1 over 100, because again, we have 100 different models, and a chord is one model, so it's 1 over, one over 100. So in this case here, the, the selectivity is estimated to be 0 0.001. But in reality, we know that Honda is the only one that makes in the, the chord. So it's not, you know, it's not this. It's not 1 over 10 times 1 over 100. These comms are actually correlated. Like, if you have, if you have an accord, then you have a Honda Accord, right? So the true selectivity is one over 100. So again, that, that independence assumption that from the last slide is going to make us be an order of magnitude off in our estimations. And then again, now if I start saying, if I'm order of magnitude off at, at the selectivity of some lower, lower operator, and I feed that now into another operator who's also going to be another order of magnitude off, then, then I'm, I'm really screwed, right? So, the way to solve this problem, and as far as I know, this, only, uh, this, this, this feature only exists in the commercial systems, is to do what are called column group statistics, or you're basically telling the database system that these columns are correlated, and therefore it should maintain statistics about them, and when it computes the, the, pre the, the selectivity during its cost model estimates, it should treat them as being correlated, right, and don't assume that, that they're independent, right? So again, basically the way it works is like the DB has to come in and tell the data system, hey, these two columns are correlated. And then if the system supports that, then they can, they can update their cost model appropriately. And right? again, only DB2 and Oracle do this. I don't, as far as I know, MySQL and Postgres don't do this, and no, none of the other major open source system, systems do this. Um, now you may be thinking, why does this, why is this manual, right? Why does the DBA have to tell the DB system? And take us why. Why can't we do this automatically? Because it's hard, right? Like, think about how to figure this out. Well, in, in this example here, it's super easy, right? Because it's I only have you know 10, 10 makes and one hundred models, but if I have a billion tuples, and I have you know and I have a really wide table with a thousand columns. Now I got to go look for every single unique combination of of you know of different columns. Look at all different possible values that can occur, right? This thing's going to blow the, the the search base is just massive. So this is why you can't do this automatically. Now, there may be way, ways to approximate this automatically, but again, as far as I know, no, no major system can do this automatically for you. You have to tell it ahead of time. Um, we, can, we can talk offline about whether DeepNet's help with this. There are people are looking into this now, but nothing, is, nothing, is, nothing, is, uh, nothing exists yet. All right, so let's look now about how these simple examples can really foul us up. Right, when we start throwing in joins into our query plan. 
So here we're doing a simple three-way join on ABC, where AID equals BID, AID equals CID, and then BID has a filter where the, the ID is greater than, than 100. All right? So assume here we have a, we, for, there's a, there's a you know, filter predicate, in, a filter operator in between the B and the join. Right? For simplicity reasons, I'm, I'm just showing the filter being done down here. Right? So the first thing we need to do is compute the cardinality of the, the access methods that are, that, are, that are retrieving tuples from, from the tables. Right? For A and C, there's no filter. So therefore, the cardinality of the operator that's scanning A and C is just the number of tuples that are in the table. I mean, that's, you know, that's easy for me to compute. I, I can get that from the catalog. For B, uh, it's going to be the number of tuples that are in B multiplied by, by, by the selectivity of, of our predicate here. All right. So then now we're going to feed up the, the output of these scan operators into our, our join. So now we need to be able to compute the, the, the cardinality of our join operators. So what's going to happen here is that if I... Uh, if these guys, if, th if, this is, if this thing is bad, right, A and C is simple, right, because there's, there's no filter. But if this thing's wrong, then now I'm feeding in the incorrect number of tuples into this join operator. And then now I've I got to figure out what the selectivity of uh, these two attributes are. And assume I don't have a foreign key. Assume that these guys aren't correlated. Like, I know nothing about them. So I have, now i got to figure out for every single value that exists in A, uh, for a, a, a dot ID, how many values are, are going to match that in B ID? And I can try to figure this out in, in, my, in my histograms, um, but you know that, that's going to be hard. So then now I take the output of this estimate, and now that's going to be fed into this estimate here to, for this join. This thing is just reading the table, so that's super simple. So now I have the same problem that I had before. Now I got to figure out. Well, what's the likelihood that a tuple that matched AID equals BID here will exist and get fed up into this thing and then also be able to match on C.ID? Right? So again, I got that wrong, this gets wrong, and this, this gets even more wrong. All right? So this, this is what we're dealing with. It's just like the, the math is just is not in your favor here. Uh, regardless of whether we're treating these things as probabilities or as not, like, these estimates are always going to get wrong, and, and just, it gets worse as we go up. So again, this is, you were to see this in the join order benchmark in the paper you guys read. The more tables you add, the more bad it gets. Right? For this reason here, because we're just, we're just throwing errors on top of errors up, up, up in the query plan. All right, so the, the paper I had you guys read uh, came from, from the Hyper team in Germany. Um, and it was an evaluation of how uh, how accurate are the are the sort of the cardinality estimates in operators for uh, a variety of different database systems, and then they wanted to use that to figure out the um, just how bad things actually can get, how awful you are from from actually the real time. So the paper doesn't is not telling you how to build a cost model. I sort of roughly sketched it out how to, how to do this here. Uh, but it's just showing you what happens when the call and the estimates in your cost model go wrong. And, and then they sort of propose some, some sort of design, uh, sort of design principles of, of building a database system, sort of what you should focus on, on trying to make your system more robust to, you know, deviations or errors in your cost models. So in the paper, they, they, they propose a new benchmark called the JOB, the Joint Order Benchmark. Um, so, in this one, they're actually they're, it's actually based on I think the IMDb data set, so the, the movie website. So, and th this is a real data set, so the 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 tables are actually going to have skewed based on a real world distribution, right? In like TPCH and TPCC, these have a uniform distribution where everything you know the the, the likelihood of, of one attribute occurring is is the same for all. Sorry, likelihood of one value occurring for a given column is the same for all values. In the join order benchmark, is actually real, you know, has has real skew in it. So they're going to generate a bunch of different queries that are going to join more and more tables, and then they want to be able to measure what the cost model thinks the selectivity is going to be of or the cardinality of the operators, and compare that with what actually the real what the real data actually looks like, right? So for this, the way they're going to use this is that they're uh, they're going to load the data in, in, you know, in once, 
And then they're going to run Analyze, which again, that fires off the background job to actually go scan all the table and let the system compute whatever statistics that it wants to compute. Right, that's the best case scenario. There's no updates. It's just I load the data in and I run Analyze. Right, and again, they want to see in, in, in this best case scenario how wrong things get. So I want to show this one graph here because this really, this is the most important one here. And so the way to understand this is that the y-axis is the uh, how far away you are from the from from being exactly accurate in, in, in the in the cardinality estimations. So this middle line here is when you're perfectly accurate, and then if you're if you're above this, then you're overestimating. Estimating. If you're below this, then you're underestimating. Right. And then the uh, the y, the x-axis is the number of tables that they're joining in in, in the query here. Right. So. The first thing to point out is that everyone, the overall trend seems to be that everyone is, is underestimating, right? As you add more tables, everyone sort of starts to, starts to go down, right? All right, so again, what is that from? Well, that's that, as we showed in that, when we talked about those assumptions, like if you assume that things are independent, then I assume my selectivity is going to be way, uh, uh, way less than it actually is. So that's why, they're, again, they're all underestimating from what the actual value should be. So the first one to point out is this, 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 one, this one guy here actually does reasonably well up to about three or four tables, right? Um, and, and across all of these, they're actually the, they're the most, they had the most tightest bounds from, from the you know, being 100% accurate versus all the other ones. The three systems here are uh, essentially all have the same trends, but the, 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 the bounds are, 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 can, will vary. Um, right again. As you add more tables, the, the the estimation gets worse, and then you you know at six tables, it just it's really bad. And then you have this middle guy here who's just like way off right away. Um, it does okay with two tables, and then after that, it's just it's way it's underestimating way more than everyone else. So I think in the paper um, uh, they tell you that that the the first one and the last one are Postgres and Hyper, right? Uh, and I think I spoiled it last time. Who is the best one here, right? Let me take a guess what, what, what this one is. Microsoft SQL Server. Okay. Then let me take a guess what these other two ones are. Oracle. Which one's Oracle? Um, so like this one here. Yeah. You said you said it was this one. Yeah. All right. Raise your hand if you think Oracle is this one. Raise your hand if you think Oracle is this one. Okay. And then there's we need we need we need a last system. What, what, take it, DB two. Okay. So you think you think this is DB two? This is Oracle. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So 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 there. Are, I wanna, I'm gonna, let's focus on SQL Server. So SQL Server does its cascades. But again, the cost model is independent of whether or not you're doing cascades or, 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 or bottom-up, right? But they're doing sampling, they're doing histograms, all right? And it's just, SQL Server is just really good. Uh, in my opinion, I consider it to be, of, you know, of these three systems here, I think it's the, at least what they've talked about publicly, in my opinion, it's the most like state-of-the-art leading-edge system, right? Oracle and DB2 are good, right? they're not bad systems. It's just, I feel like SQL Server has, they've, based on what they've talked about publicly, it seems like this thing is, is, is way you know, farther ahead than, than everyone else. Um, again, across, so I would say for all database systems, open source and commercial, SQL Server probably has the best query optimizer. So, and, and, and it shows here. But let's now look into see, uh, a little more detail about what actually happens when, when, you, when you get correct estimates. So for this one, they're going to instrument uh, Postgres 9.4. And the way to understand this graph here is that the, the, the x-axis is what percentage of the queries that they're going to execute are within the... Uh, or, or, how much slower are they from the the actual execution of, of the query itself, right? So if you, sorry, how much, let me start over. They instrumented Postgres, and they, they made it so that rather than 
doing, using histogram to estimate the cardinality of an operator. They modified the system so that it, it, this, you know, whatever function says go estimate what the cardinality is, they replace that with a magic oracle that always gives them back exactly the correct answer every time. Right? So the way to read this is it's how, uh, how far they are from the, what the real estimate is going to do versus what the, uh, if, what the query performance will be if you have the exact estimates versus what if you use the, the built-in cost model that it's making approximations. So if you're in this band here, 0 0.9 to 1.1, means that you're, you're the, the performance of the query using the approximations is roughly the same of, of what you get when you have approximate, you know, w w if you have the exact result. And then over here is like you're getting way, you know, way, way slower uh, as you go in this direction. And then this is what percentage of the queries in the total number of queries that they gave into the system uh, fit into these different buckets here. Right, so this shows you that uh, when you're using estimations, that 60% of the queries are uh, 1.2 to uh, 1.1 or great more sl times slower than the you know the queries when you have the, the true cardinal the, the exact estimations here, right? And so what's going on is because Postgres is underestimating the, the cardinality of its operators. It thinks that the the you know the number of tuples that it's going to is going to pass from one operator to the next is is less is lower than it actually is, and they use these cardinality estimates to size the hash table for when you do a hash join, right? Or decide whether you you, you even want to do a hash join at all, right? If if you're only going to access a small number of tuples in a join, the if it, you know, uh, then a nested loop join is is, is super fast because you don't have to set up a hash table, you don't have to build it, you don't probe it. You just do these two little for loops on like four tuples in the outer table and the inner table. That's you know as fast as you're going to ever get. So Postgres ends up because it's underestimating the, the cardinality of its operators to saying, "Oh, you're at, you're operating only with ten tuples. That's a loop join, right?" And then it starts running it and it says, "Oh shit, this is not this is not ten tuples." <laughs> but by that point, the, the query plan is baked, right? You can't switch back to do the hash join, right? Why not? Uh, you, so that one you have to do adaptive query processing, right? So you have to be able to say, I, my query optimizer made a mistake. Go back and rerun, you know, rerun the optimizer and get a new plan based on something I, you know, based on what data I've seen so far. Uh, say it again. His statement is the nested loop join and the hash join get the same result, right? But like, so. You could do it the way, actually, one way to do this is that uh, if I see now the, as, if I see that I have like, I thought it was gonna have like 10 tuples, so now I have 1 billion tuples coming in. Before I even start the nested loop join, I could say, don't do the nested loop join, switch over to a hash join. You could do that in some ways. It depends on how they're, they're, they're pipelining tuples, um, but they don't. It's an engineering thing, right? It's sort of like, it's like once the optimizer makes the decision, they go with it. Now, adaptive query processing or optimization is when you say, uh, I think the optimizer made a mistake, go back and regenerate a query plan. And then now you have, you know, now you have to you get into this world of like, do I throw away all the data I've, I've processed so far and start up from scratch? Or can I come up with a new query plan that can use some of the data I've already processed and just, you know, continue with, with that? That would essentially do what, what you're proposing. But as far as I know, I mean, I know Postgres doesn't do that. Uh, I don't know actually what SQL Server and Oracle do. I think they throw everything away and start over, right? You primarily, you primarily do that for, for, uh, for join ordering. Switching between nested loop and hash join. Um, there's no reason you could do it. I, I, I mean, Postgres doesn't do it, I think for engineering reasons. Okay, so the, all right, so, so in this case here again, things are running slower. Because a lot of queries end up being nested loop joins when they really should be hash, hash joins. So the next thing they did was uh, in Postgres, you can pass a flag to say, sorry, yes. Yes. Uh, so the leftmost bar in this graph said that some queries actually run faster when given false cardinalities than true ones. Yes. But I, I don't know why. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> we, we can ask Victor. I don't know. I don't, oh. Uh, it was too 
error one way, error the other way, the errors cancel out. Like two wrongs make a right, two left, two make a right. Kind of thing. Oh, okay. it's, it's just noise. Um, oh no, you're, you're saying like it, it. Like the error from the first thing fed into error in the second part, which oh. turned out to be really good. Got it. Okay, so he said like the error for the first join operator fed into the the first join overestimated. The second join that it fed into underestimated, and then that came out to be exactly exactly correct. Now, why this is running, you know, zero point three faster, or you know, I don't know. All right, but it's I mean it's 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 a pretty low amount, like it's you know one or two percent. All right, so all right, what I'm saying I was saying here is that again the 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 first. Uh, sort of assessment of why things are running slower is because it's picking nested loop join when it should be picking hash join. So in Postgres, you can pass a flag in your session, like you open up the terminal, and you can say set no merge join or something like that, or no nested loop join. Uh, you can tell the optimizer to not even consider a nested loop join for your query. So in this case here, it only considers a hash join. But now you still see that uh, you're still getting worse performance. Right then, then you know where you should be if you have true cardinalities. Right, it, it did help. Right, fewer queries are getting picked as nested loop join, but still, you're, you, some queries are still running slower. In this case, it turns out that um, the in this version of Postgres, they were using the the cardinal, cardinality estimates from the operators to decide how to allocate the hash table when you do the hash join. Right, so you say, I, you know, I'm gonna do 100. I have a, my cardinality is 100, so to make sure I, I have a hash table that has, you know, 200 slots for, for you know, to, to put things in. And so, if you undersize the hash table, what happens is that, as we talked about, you end up with these really long, you know, it, it, I think they were doing a, a bucket hash hash table. So you have these really long bucket chains that, that essentially becomes a sequential scan every single time you do a probe. Right. So. Again, if you had correct estimates about what the cardinality was, then you could say, all right, well, my hash table needs to be this big because my data set's coming in is going to be this big. And then you don't worry about you know, these, these long sequential scans. So to prove that this was actually the case, uh, again, this was Postgres 9.4. Then in Postgres 9.5, they had the ability to, to dynamically resize the hash table if your estimates go wrong. So they backported that feature from Postgres 9.5 into 9.4, and they reran the, the same experiment. And then now you see that you know, there's, there's more queries that are actually met, or, or getting closer where you should be if you, if you have the true cardinality, right? So the this is a good example of showing that it's not just picking whether one operator is should be a hash join versus a net loop, nested loop join. It's actually what you're actually doing in that operator can be greatly affected by the, the estimations that your cost model is making, right? All right, so uh, Victor then, he, uh, he and I were talking about this, and he sent me sort of a, 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 a synopsis of what he thought were the most important things that came out of this experiment or this study that he did. Uh, and the, the first is that they felt that having an accurate um, uh, you know, cost model from your query optimizer End up actually being in some cases more important than just having like the fastest engine in the world, right? Like, if you you know if who cares that we can do SIMD processing or query compilation and all the other tricks that we talked about the entire semester, if our optimizer is, is total shit and we're like picking the worst join orders and we're always doing nested loop join, then who cares how fast the engine is in like you know simple examples? When we actually throw real real, real world data at it, uh, then we're just gonna get you know we're just, we're just gonna get crushed. So the the in being able to pick up the join ordering is probably the most important thing from all of this. The other thing they, they, they found was basically that the cardinality estimates are always going to be wrong. Uh, so when you actually implement the operators in your system, you want to have them be uh, adaptive enough to not or adaptive so they don't have to rely on estimations coming from from the query optimizer because you just assume that's going to be wrong and. As the data comes in, you want to be able to adapt whatever it is your, your system is doing to account for the actual data that it's actually seeing, right? So you being able to resize the hash table automatically rather than just you know taking whatever the cost model gives you and just fixing the size to be exactly that. And we're doing this now in, in our own system. Uh, we haven't pushed it to the master branch yet. This is in the, the separate LLVM branch, 
but we can reorder like predicates. So some predicates are more selective than others. The cost model might think that you want to execute your predicates in this order. We can then shuffle things on the fly as, as we see real data. The other things that he said that, uh, and you sort of see this in design about uh, in, in, in Hyper, is that having an engine that is can do fast sequential scans and fast hash joins uh, may actually end up being better than having all these sort of fancy indexes to do joins and, 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 and lookups, right? Because the more indexes you have, then the more complex the estimations have to be for your, in your cost model. So rather than try to account for any of this, you just say, screw it, I'm, just, I'm gonna sequential scan everything and just rip through the data really fast and, and, and who cares what, you know, whether an index would help me here. Um, for analytical queries, I maybe agree with this. For some things, maybe not, not, not for others, right? I, I, I have mixed feelings about this one. And the last one, he says that uh, trying to have a more accurate cost model, like using the micro benchmarks, the stuff that I talked about at the very beginning, like trying to you know, profile the hardware and, and include that in your estimations, uh, they felt that that was a waste of time. Just having better cardinality estimations is the most important thing. So that means having better statistics, better sketches, whether you're throwing deep nets in there or not, uh, we can talk. We can talk, talk about that separately. Um, but getting this right is more important than having sort of more, more fine-grained accuracy of what the harbors actually can do. Okay. So I thought these are pretty useful, right? Again, like some of these we, we've, we've adopted in the design of our system. Other ones, uh, not so much. All right. So the last thing I, I want to talk about, and this will lead us into what we'll talk about on Monday. Um, is this project from, from IBM from, I guess at this point, 2000, 2001, so 18 years ago, uh, for this thing called Leo. So you may be thinking, and it's sort of what he was sort of suggesting earlier, is that if my cost model is going to make these estimates and they're going to be wrong, then as I run my query and I see, oh, the data is actually completely different, can I just fix myself? Or can I just possibly also go fix the estimates, right? And this is what IBM was trying to do with this thing called the learning optimizer. So the idea would be that I, my query shows up, I run it through my, my query optimizer, I gener the cost model generates estimates about what it thinks the data looks like, I then run that query, and then now I observe are the estimations about the cardinality and the selectivity of my predicates, is that matching what I'm actually seeing in the real data? And then when the query finishes, they, they check to see whether the estimations differ from the uh, from the real data, and if they differ, then they try to feed back the real data you know, you know, back into the optimizer, so that when the next query shows up, they can rely on the data they've already collected from the previous query, right? So this seems like this would solve this problem, right? It's like like oh, our estimates are wrong. We run the real data, see what actually happens. <laughs> the I would say that every DB2 administrator that I've ever talked to, and I ask them about this, that they always say that the first thing they do when they install DB2 is they turn all this off, because it never worked. Um, and we had, Oracle has something similar to do memory management, like automatic memory management for the buffer pool manager, and we talked to some DBAs uh, a few, few weeks ago, and they're like, yeah, we turn that off immediately. Like all this automated stuff never worked, right? I, I, so I, I mean, I, I never, I never found out why. Why? I've heard there were some engineering difficulties at IBM to get this thing to actually to work the way they wanted to work uh, and fit into the rest of the system correctly. I think this didn't work because of engineering reasons, um, and it's a shame because it seems like this would would solve our problems. But because of this, I think a lot of people, a lot of these, a lot of commercial systems have been hesitant to adopt similar techniques, just because this thing sort of, you know, fell apart. But but this would then lead us into what we're going to talk about on Monday of like the sort of revival or it's not a revival, but a continuation of a long history of trying to do automated tuning uh, in, 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 in database systems to sort of alleviate some of these difficulties. Right. So now, you know, what, what's in vogue is machine learning and the people are trying to apply machine learning to these problems. But it actually goes back into like the 1970s. Right? People, people have been working on this problem for a long time. So, so this is just sort of one example of this that, di that didn't work. Okay, so uh, the main takeaway today is that for an in-memory database, 
being able to estimate the number of tuples that we're going to process per operator is going to be the, uh, for us, a reasonable approximation of what the, the, the execution cost of a query is going to be. Um, and of course, now that means that in order to, to, to estimate the number of tuples you're going to process per operator, you got to know what the, the, card, you know, the cardinality is of, of your children operators. And then as, as we showed, things can go bad pretty quickly. Um, and so I think the way uh, Microsoft does the cost estimations is using combination of sampling and sketches is, is the right way to do this. And we tried doing this in our own database system, but we never vetted it to determine whether it was actually accurate. And what will happen is in the summer when we bring over the, the old optimizer from Peloton into the new system, we're probably not going to bring over the cost model. We will start with a simple cost model that basically says, if I have an index, my cost is zero. If I have a sequential scan, my cost is one. Like that's the simplest cost model you could ever have. That won't handle join ordering for us, but at least that'll get us started on being able to pick indexes. Okay? Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the OE because I'm OG. Ice Cube down with the STI. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on because I needed just a little more kick. Like a fish after just one sip, yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off. A ball just dropped off. Cause ain't eyes hopped off. And my hood won't be the same. After Ice Cube, take a say I to the brain. Yeah.